Thanks for joining us. I'm Alex Bell, and this is To The Point. We are all watching as results continue to roll in after Election Day. And here in Northern California and across the nation, some races will be decided by the ballots that are still being counted right now. So these include ballots dropped in the mail just a few days ago. Becca Habegger shows us how you can be confident your vote will count. At least you do get a chance to vote whether they throw them away or whatever they do with them. You hear all kinds of stories of things going on with mail-in ballots, so I brought my mail-in ballot, handed it in. Even among those who came out to vote, some people have concerns, questions, and doubts about whether the ballot they cast will be counted. Your vote matters, even though it, who knows where it's going to go. I'm wondering if our votes are being counted or if they're being thrown away. We really want to break the cycle of people being concerned about what happens to their ballot. Jana Haynes, Sacramento County Elections spokesperson, says many people don't realize the lengths to which the county goes to ensure a secure and fair process. For example, a voter needs to sign their mail-in ballot for it to count. If they missed a signature because a lot of people forget to sign the envelope, we have to reach back out. We don't throw that ballot away. And check your email. You might have received confirmation that your ballot was received and counted. Here's mine from Tuesday night. You know, I know that there are rumors around that if there's a blowout, we stop tabulating, and that's just not true. Um, you know, we process and tabulate all of the votes down to the end. Um, you know, we had that 29 days to certify the election, and we'll be tabulating votes for several weeks. She emphasizes the results released on election night were preliminary. She estimates those only account for one third to one half of all the ballots they'll ultimately receive and count. There are races that are within a few hundred votes margin and the votes that we have left to tally could absolutely make the difference. So every vote does matter. She says some worry about people trying to vote twice by using their mail-in ballot and then also trying to vote in person. But we do have real-time information in our vote centers with our computer systems that tell us if we have already received a ballot from a voter. Whichever ballot the county receives first is the one that counts. So not only will only the first vote count, but that voter would be reported to the Secretary of State's Office for Voter Fraud. Mail ballots are still flooding in, she says, so the county will release updated elections results this Friday at 4 p.m. And the balance of power in Congress is still yet to be determined. Neither political party has the majority needed to take power, as many heated races are still just too close to call. And three of them are right here in Northern California. Brandon Ritterman joins us to break things down. And Brandon, how are the races looking at this point? <laughs> so I'm going to start with the one, Alex, that touches the uh, Sacramento metro area. This is the third congressional district. It's a freakishly large district. It goes almost all the way down to Death Valley, goes up way north of Sacramento. Um, they, they redrew this in redistricting. And you can see right now it looks pretty comfortable for uh, state, state lawmaker Kevin Kiley, uh, 53 to 46. But... The estimated total vote, ignore the percent reporting and look at this one. We've still got about two thirds of the vote yet to come in. So there's 9,000 votes apart right here, but we've only got 145,000. You know, about double that number is what we're expecting to still be out there. That's why this race is too close to call. You can see an example of this right here in Placer County. Uh, you know, similar margins right there, 9,000 votes, and that touches a lot of the metro area. So could that turn bluer? Hard to say, but I can also show you that none of them are leaning too heavily blue or red at this moment. So that's just something interesting to watch. You're going to have to watch that race a lot longer. Same with this one, just a little bit further south in the Stockton area. Josh Harder trying to hold on to his seat in Congress. They redrew his district a little bit. Uh, and, and he right now is looking strong, but that could change. And then the, here's the closest one. We go down even further south to, you know, Turlock, Modesto area. This one only separated by two hundred votes at this point. So you want to talk about every vote counts, Alex. There is a perfect example, but more than half the vote still yet to be tallied. We're going to be watching all three of those races, as well as some down in Southern California. They could have implications on which party ends up controlling Congress. All right, Brandon, thank you. In the city of Sacramento, we have been talking about it all day. The results for Measure O are still being counted. Take a look at your screen right now. 56% saying yes. So Measure O, if passed, would make it easier to clear homeless camps in the city. But it's a lot more complex than that. I spoke to Sacramento's mayor one-on-one -on -one today inside City Hall about why he supports the measure. Oh, so that's the Emergency Shelter and Enforcement Act that would ban encampments on public property in the city of Sacramento. It would also require the city manager to authorize hundreds of new shelters within three months of it taking effect. So if the measure does pass, 
how will the city really handle not only getting those shelters up, but making sure that they're operating efficiently? Well, there, there's also a $5 million limitation on how much the city uh, will spend on additional shelter. Remember, we're not starting from scratch. 17,000 people have gone through our homeless uh, entry system in the city and county of Sacramento since 2017 and gotten housed. And yet, and yet, the problem has grown worse. And so Measure O is a small piece that I hope will push us, yes, to build more shelter. But the real important part of this, and frankly, the only reason I supported it, was because it requires, before it goes into effect, a legally binding partnership agreement with the County of Sacramento. Because the city is not a homeless service agency. We don't do mental health. We don't do substance abuse treatment. Um, the county is the health and human services agency for the state of California. And so we desperately need their help and their partnership if we're going to make the kind of difference on homelessness that the people rightfully expect. And what about the critics who say that this is a business community funded measure that really focuses on enforcement, not necessarily helping people who are experiencing well, homelessness? Well, I, I, I don't like the way the measure was put together. I, I, I think, uh, I hope the business community maybe learned a few lessons that you ought to work more collaboratively with the, the community, with your elected officials. Um, you know, they threatened us with a, you know, an, a, an initiative that could bankrupt the city unless we, quote, negotiated with them. Well, we're already building 1,100 beds and already doing more than our share. Um, and uh, so I'm not thrilled about the way that it was put together. But in the end, I support it because it provides that linkage with the county. And last question I want to ask you. We know that in Sacramento County alone, there's over 9,000 yes. people experiencing homelessness on any given night. Correct. If you had to give yourself a grade on how you're handling the homelessness crisis, what grade would you give yourself? I don't know. I'd give myself a grade. I mean, I think here's the tough part of this question. Um, I've actually done everything that I promised the voters I would do. I have brought tens of millions of dollars to the city. We've increased our shelter and bed capacity from less than 100 when I started to 1,100 a night. And so in terms of results, we've gotten thousands of people off the streets. In terms of results, done everything I said I would do. And yet, I recognize the problem is worse. People are becoming homeless faster than we can get them off the streets. So what will I'm take? responsible for, I'm always accountable. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, uh, I'm not satisfied. And I know the people are not satisfied. And that's why I continue at it. And that's why I'm now working so hard with the county to try to finalize a partnership. So let's continue to fight for a better outcome, but also recognize that we need a national housing policy. I mean, we need more help, frankly, from the federal government. All right, let's go ahead and talk about some props because we were inundated with ads for Prop 26 and 27 for months and it did not translate well at the polls. So after the break, we're talking about the future of sports betting right here in California. The groups behind Propositions 26 and 27 made a big gamble in their efforts to pass sports betting in California and they lost big. So between support and opposition, the campaign spent roughly $450 million, making them the most expensive ballot proposition campaigns in U.S. history. But that did not translate at the polls. Brandon Ritterman is back to show us just how much money they lost. And Brandon, how bad are the numbers? What did I tell you during the break? Money can't buy you love. <laughs> Money can't buy you love. It's really stinking bad. Look, 70-30 right here on Prop 26. This was the in-person version of the sports betting. And it lost here. Every county on the map is solid red right here. And, you know, if I drill down on these numbers just a little bit more, we can turn on the heat map here, and it'll show you how truly bad this is. Here's your closest county. That's Alpine County. Still going down more than 60-40 in the in the closest county that they had going on there so that's just how bad that was if i take you over to prop uh 27 i need to do this right here this was the online version even redder okay <laughs> that's how much this one went down 83 
to just over 16, a 3.6 million vote difference, and there's the two of them. I see some kind of antipathy towards either tech or the money that was spent on the ads, maybe a mix of both. Either way, is this going to come back? I don't know if aligning these two planets would be enough to do it, but we'll have to wait and see what happens next election. But money can't buy you love. I know That's that. the quote of the day. That's the quote of the day. All right, Brandon, thanks. Thanks. All right, so what exactly went wrong? Political analyst Steve Swat says that pre-election polls showed that Californians, especially women, simply don't want to dramatically expand gambling. And all the money the campaign spent to flood the airwaves with ads, that might have been the final nail in the coffin. That made, I think, voters, potential voters, angry that their lives were being, being intruded upon uh, by all these, these negative ads. And also, it created so much confusion and doubt in voters. And traditionally, when voters are confused and when they have doubt about any issue, they will either not vote on it or, or, or will vote no. But don't expect this to be the end. Online gambling in California would make companies billions of dollars. They'll be back. And the way that Steve put it, there's too much money for them at stake to not come back. But perhaps they'll change their strategy for next time. All right, so moving on from politics, when we come back, a building full of history is up for grabs in Roseville. Free of charge, free of charge, but there is one catch. Man 2 will have the latest. So what if I told you you can own a historic building for free, to which you might ask, in this economy? Yeah, that's right, it's free. The catch is you have to be able to move it. Preservationists say the railroad history it holds is invaluable. And in this exclusive story, Van 2 shows us why it is worth saving. Drive by and you wouldn't think twice. It's just been hiding in plain sight. Some may see an abandoned eyesore with its peeling camel green paint. I feel like it's kind of aided it in blending in over the years. And it's a roaded porch. It's a cool porch. But Alexa Roberts, founder of the Belvedere Preservation Alliance, doesn't see a dilapidated building. I see a building that's full of possibilities. It is pretty wild that I'm standing here talking to you about this building. That's because the 114-year-old structure at 315 Church Street in Roseville, California, is one of a kind. It's extremely rare. So of the dozen that or so that was built, this is the only known surviving uh, Southern Pacific uh, Emergency Railroad Hospital. At the turn of the 20th century, railroad construction continued to boom, along with the physical risks. It dealt with a lot of employee injuries. Wanting to retain employee loyalty and also to care for their workers, they started contracting with local uh, surgeons in the area. Thus marked the infancy of our modern healthcare system. By 1870, the railroad company established its first of two big hospitals in Sacramento. Workers paid a fee and the company subsidized the rest. These extravagant hospitals in Sacramento no longer exist. Later came smaller emergency hospitals like the one at 315 Church Street. It's been serving our town since 1908. They were built where industrial accidents were more likely to happen. When you had a railroad hospital like this, it could provide immediate emergency first aid care. The 1,200 square foot building was efficient and followed a basic layout. Blueprints of a similar building show the inside. You had a doctor's office, a small pharmacy, you had an emergency surgery room, and then you had a recuperating room, and then a small waiting room. It had three beds for uh, injured railroad workers to recover. One of Roseville's original Board of Trustees members and former mayor, Dr. Bradford Woodbridge, treated patients here before they were transferred to larger hospitals in Sacramento and San Francisco. I mean, imagining doctors that took care of our railroad workers using that sink that's still in there, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> the railroad company closed its hospital department in 1968, and historians like Doobie thought the railroad hospitals had all since been demolished until this year. I was just shocked and delighted to find out that one of these buildings had actually survived. 
Narrowly escaping debris from the Roseville Rail Yard explosion in 1973, the building went on to serve as a training classroom, an office space, and 10 years ago, storage for the Boy Scouts. Robert said she learned that in the 70s, a local group had saved it from demolition. So now it's our turn, so what are we going to do with this building? The city of Roseville says the parcel where the building sits will likely be used for more parking as Amtrak increases train service, and it's too expensive for the city to restore. Officials say they did a thorough inventory of historic structures. 315 Church Street does not have an historic designation. But Dubé says with some restoration work, it has the potential to be included in the National Register of Historic Places because of its unique backstory and original details. These classical supports are my favorite part probably because they're totally original. There's original wood flooring which is always exciting. It's even painted that seafoam green that these buildings used to have on the inside. It can be a gem again in our city I believe. To save this history, preservationists like Roberts and the city are now working together to find someone to move the building for free. Do you know how much it would potentially cost to move a building like this? It would be between 40 and 50,000, but we got to factor in the 12,000 from the city and lots of fundraising. Well, the community of Roseville has a unique opportunity to potentially save and preserve this building. It definitely would be um, a magnet for uh, people who appreciate railroad history. Dubé and Roberts says it doesn't necessarily have to be rehabilitated to its original form. Any sort of new way to reuse the building can still help share its history for generations to come. It just tells another part of the railroad history, not only for Roseville, not only for California, but it has the potential of telling that railroad history for the Western United States. Bantu's with us now. I've been so excited for this story, our resident history nerd that we love so much. Yes, yes. What an amazing story. Yeah, it completely. And the preservationists here who are trying to save this, they hope that it could be refurbished into a museum building or even a small coffee shop, even like an Airbnb unique stay. So oh. the last thing they really want is it to be demolished for a few parking spaces. And lose all that history. Yeah, and what mm -hmm. I think is so interesting is that our employees sponsored Healthcare tracks with our railroad history. I never knew that. That was so interesting. Yeah, and we're in the middle of open enrollment for a lot of people, right? So um, uh, a lot of people replicated Southern Pacific's uh, system, but it wasn't until the 1940s, really, when the government really incentivized all employers to provide health insurance, and that is the dawn of the system we know today. Wow, and are there any takers on this house for free? <laughs> yeah, so no serious offers now, but the Preservation Alliance, they're fundraising and they're asking around, and they also want people to send in photos or documents that their families might have because it was operating until the 70s, and they're looking for those artifacts. Hopefully they find someone. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you, Van. We appreciate it. All right, let's take a look outside at our Gilmore backyard. Still seeing those cool temperatures. Let's take a look at Sacramento, seeing 54. Marysville at 51, Tahoe still freezing at 28. Here's a quick check of your 10 day forecast. Cool weather sticking around. Well, it's the day after elections and thousands of political yard signs. They may as well just be useless or maybe not. Think again. Habitat for Humanity is standing by to make something out of nothing. The folks over at Habitat for Humanity Restore in Sacramento are asking campaigns and anyone with a yard sign to bring them this Saturday to keep them out of the landfills and into the hands of teachers and students and anyone who can upcycle the signs into pieces of art. So you can drop off your sign to the Restore this Saturday from 10 to 3 and then you can go by and pick up those signs from noon to 4 if you would like. The address is right there on your screen. So if you have signs, drop by. All right, we are continuing to follow the election results very closely. We'll have more details coming up at 11. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you tomorrow. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.